Hey there, thank you for joining us for another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. It is May 3rd, 2023, and this is Fishing for Solutions, Climate Change, and the Seafood Industry with Sarah Schumann. And this is one of our, uh, in a series of programs to complement our exhibit Code Red, uh, Climate, Justice, and Natural History, which is on display at Maine Historical Society through December 30th, 2023. And these programs touch on and help to highlight and better explore and understand a lot of the themes and ideas explored in the exhibit about Maine's environment, natural history, climate change, biodiversity, and in uh, tonight's case, um, climate change and fishing. Before we uh, begin our talk, I just want to take a moment uh, and say that Maine Historical Society recognizes that what is currently referred to as Maine is Wabanaki homelands, a place that Wabanaki people have stewarded for over 13,000 years. Wherever we are in Maine, we are on Wabanaki homelands. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations within these lands and waters. Understanding Wabanaki history is vital to understanding Maine, and we are committed to helping provide education about this history through partnerships with Wabanaki people. Our talk this evening is Fishing for Solutions, Climate Change in the Seafood Industry. Uh, commercial fishermen have a front row seat to the impacts of climate change, and they are in a unique and valuable position to help craft the response to the climate change crisis. The seafood industry is certainly very much a part of Maine's history, of its culture, its economy, its identity. And so to talk about this topic, uh, joining us this evening is Sarah Schumann who fishes in Rhode Island and Alaska and is the principal of Shining Sea Fisheries Consulting LLC and coordinator of the Fishery Friendly Climate Action Campaign. A 15 plus year veteran of the seafood industry as well as a passionate advocate for the ocean ecosystems that sustain wild fisheries, Sarah holds a BS in Marine Affairs from the University of Rhode Island and an MS in Nature, Society, and Environmental Policy from the University of Oxford. She is the author of two books, Rhode Island's Shellfish Heritage and Ecological History, and, excuse me, Simmering the Sea, Diversifying Our Cookery to Sustain Our Fisheries. And uh, the, she's the founder and editor of the online multimedia journal, Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Marketing. Sarah, Thanks you so much for joining us this evening to share your expertise with us. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you to the Maine Historical Society and to all of you who have joined us tonight for your interest in hearing about the seafood industry's leadership on climate change. I look forward to sharing my perspective on these issues with you. Um, and to kick it off before I launch into my presentation, Kathleen, if you could show that video. Kathleen's going to pull up a video that's about what some uh, Southern New England fishermen, including myself and some of my buddies in Rhode Island and Massachusetts are, are doing on our own homes to uh, address the urgent climate crisis. There's no better food that you could put in your body than wild caught seafoods. It's been part of our heritage for generations and generations. This is a real working waterfront. This isn't one that's made in Disney World. It's a really wonderful way to make a living. Our commercial fisheries rely on a healthy ecosystem. Once it's lost, it never will come back. Healthy ecosystem means it will be a steady flow of fish to consumers and to businesses. I went solar in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The motivation for putting solar panels on our home was number one, economics. It saves money. Number two, we were really concerned with the degradation of the electric grid. It just seemed like the right thing to be doing to be looking into alternative sources of energy and not to have to depend on these fossil fuels anymore. The system on our house was installed by Revolusun. I used a company called Solar Consulting. 
My solar panels were installed by NEC Solar. My solar panels now power all of my household appliances and they also power my electric vehicle. I haven't had to pump gas in over a year. With gas prices being what they have become, this investment is paying off a lot faster than I ever thought it would. I think more people should be considering solar energy because of all the benefits it has to offer including the economic benefits and the environmental benefits. It's more stable and dependable as a source of energy, I think, than all the other renewable forms of energy that are now available to us. Rooftop solar creates more jobs in local communities than any other renewable technology source. It puts money directly back into the pockets of homeowners and has a minimal environmental impact because it takes place on the already built environment. That's why I encourage all my friends and all my neighbors to eat seafood and go solar. Eat seafood and go solar. Eat seafood, go solar. Thanks, and while Kathleen's switching up to the um, the main PowerPoint slides, um, that uh, video was produced about a year ago. Uh, Dean Pisante, who's fe featured in that video, is my captain in Point Judith. We fish on the Gilnet or Oceana. Um, and he, uh, I went solar first, he went solar. Then the guy across from us at the dock, the TT dock in Point Judith, uh, went solar. And there are now two other fishermen at the TT Dock and Point Judith who are installing panels that I know of. There may be more. Um, so this is really kind of the beautiful thing about distributed en uh, renewable energy like solar is that everyone can do it. And when you see your friends and neighbors and you can learn from them, it can just take off like, like wildfire. And it's pretty cool to see the benefits flow throughout the community like that. Um, but now I'm going to segue into the main PowerPoint presentation here, um, which uh, the title I was I was given um, by Kathleen is Fishing for Solutions, which is a good catchy title to bring people in. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a less exciting sounding um, topic of just caring for all of the things that matter during times of crisis and confrontation or contestation. Um, and that's a boring sounding way of saying that when crisis strikes, um, the title of this of this webinar series is Code Red, so I think we're all aware that the that there is, um, you know, we're on a we're on a fast track to doing some irreversible damage to the planet if we don't if we don't act. So that is indeed a crisis, but um, that is not a reason to abandon caring for all of the other things that we have always cared about and always will, including the wild seafood that feeds us and the ocean ecosystems that produce us, produce it. Um, and that's what I'm gonna get into in this presentation. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I am a member of the diverse and motley group of individuals, families, and businesses sprinkled around our coastal communities in the US who go out um, into the ocean or our estuaries and sounds and bays, catch, uh, process, deliver, wild caught seafood for the public to enjoy. Um, and like many of those people, I not only participate in the catching of fish, but also in some fierce and dedicated advocacy to defend the places that produce that seafood that benefits all of us. Um, most recently, as Kathleen said, in the form of this newly, uh, relatively new bi-coastal initiative called the Fishery Friendly Climate Action Campaign, which I'll tell you more about throughout this proposal. Um, Unlike a lot of members of the commercial fishing industry, I wasn't born into this line of work. Uh, so I'm going to start this presentation by telling you a little bit about my own background and what brought me to this work. Um, I was hoping that this would make this experience a little bit more personal. And it feels a little funny because I can't see your faces. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to get personal um, and it won't give you the chance to do so as well. But um, I hope that each of you sort of has a chance also to reflect on your own journey and what brings you to this conversation about, about climate change and what the values are that motivate your participation, because I think it's so important at a time like this um, to really connect uh, at our core of, of the values that we all share. Um, so you can go ahead and uh, flip the slide, Kathleen, please.
So my journey to fisheries and my journey as an environmentalist began when I was in the fourth grade. We did a big curriculum on the environment. It was the first time I'd really heard about it. Um, and I think the reason was that Earth Day 1990 was kind of a big deal. It was the 20 year anniversary of the first Earth Day in 1970, um, which was sort of the dawning of uh, modern day environmental consciousness in the US. And in 1990, it went global in a big way. Um, and there were a lot of things that were different back then. Not only was I much cuter, um, and not only was the only way to get information about something to send a self-addressed envelope to P.O. box and ask for more information, um, but things were different in, in the planet as well. Uh, back then, um, while there was a dawning consciousness of what they used to call the greenhouse gas effect, um, then they could call it global warming and now called climate change. Um, and only it was only two years since prominent NASA climate scientist James Hansen had addressed Congress in the middle of the heat wave of a heat wave and alerted them to uh, his findings that the earth was becoming warmer than any other time in recent history. And that with 99% certainty, he could attribute it to the burning of fossil fuels. Um, but, but back then, um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was only 330 parts per million, up only 80 parts per million from its pre-industrial baseline. For reference, we're now at 420 parts per million. So that's how far things have come. Back then, both parties talked about climate change. It hadn't become the polarized issue. And companies like Exxon hadn't yet begun to um, invest money in a massive climate denial campaign. So back then, when advertisements like this said, be a hero and save the world, it sounded like something that we could actually do. And so as a little fourth grader, I decided, OK, sign me up. You can go to the next slide. So the first step, be a hero. Um, that's actually how I wound up in fishing, uh, looking for heroes. Not the kind who wears a cape, not the kind who gets uh, you know, famous through elected office or getting on um, you know, Hollywood or getting rich and influential, um, but the kind who works closer to the ground level and makes change collaboratively with their communities um, and I spent a long time looking for that kind of hero that I could learn from. And I found it when I was around 20 years old um, in an unlikely place. <clears throat> I grew up here in, in I grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, but at the age of 20, a series of events deposited me on the shores of Chile, um, where I met my, the first ever fisherman I'd ever encountered. You can flip the slide. And I was immediately captivated by the combination of humble lifestyle that these fishermen led, which involved going to sea every morning in a 20 or 25 foot open skiff to harvest fish by hand, um, combined with their outspoken activism, which took them from the halls of Congress to the streets of towns like uh, like like this um, picture here, here of Mayween in um, southern Chile, um, where fishermen have engaged in a 20 plus year fight by now. Um, at the time, it was less. But um, to defend their bay that they depend on for catching fish and shellfish from a, uh, a, um, a pulp mill that wants to put a, um, an effluent pipe into their bay. And I was lucky enough to meet some of these fishermen and uh, be invited to participate alongside them in one of these protests. And for me, and at that point in time, that was exactly the kind of hero that I wanted to learn from and wanted to become. Um, so at some point, I packed my bags, came back to the U.S., and went back to college at URI and used some connections I formed with fellow students there to get a job on a lobster boat in Point Judith. Um, and in the almost 20 years since, I've spent my time fishing, working in seafood industry um, in both Rhode Island and Alaska, and, and taking a lot of coastal trips around the US. And I've met many, many more heroes. You can flip to the next slide. So some of the heroic activities that have taken place took, took place before my time, like this uh, flotilla um, by the shell fishermen of Narragansett Bay that took place in the early 80s in collaboration with the environmental group Save the Bay and resulted in some major upgrades to wastewater treatment plants at the time, which had been dumping just tons of raw sewage into the bay. You can go to the next slide. 
And I've heard and read about the um, impressive fights led by the Gloucester fishermen's wives, uh, especially Angela San Filippo, who teamed in the 1970s and 80s with the Environmental Group Conservation Law Foundation to, uh, to keep oil drilling at bay in George's Bank, an area of incredibly productive fishery resources that has sustained their families and communities for generations and will continue to do so thanks, thanks to their efforts. You can go to the next slide. And in fact, many of the heroes I've met turn out to be women, despite the fact that we are generally um, a minority in the fishing industry, like Ricky Ott, who led her community of Cordova, Alaska, through the cleanup of the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989, and since then has gone on to um, help with fishermen who participated in the cleanup of the BP oil spill to make sure that they're compensated for health uh, health. Um, uh, impacts that they suffered as a result of that cleanup. You can go to the next slide. And like Diane Wilson, who many of you may have heard of because she's been in the news a lot recently, Diane is a fourth generation Texas shrimper who held Formosa Plastics accountable for polluting Lavaca Bay in the 1990s, which is profiled in her really wonderful book, An Unreasonable Woman. Um, and she didn't quit there. She has continued with decades of heroic environmental activism, including in 2020, a 36 day hunger strike to stop a polluted, to stop a planned dredging project in the, Tex in the Texas's Matagorda ship channel, which would have um, not only dredged up contaminated sediments, but also enabled continued export of oil products. Um, and just last week, Diane was awarded the very prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize for grassroots activism. Next slide. And at times I've been privileged to stand shoulder to shoulder with these heroes. Uh, the community of Dillingham, Alaska, where I've spent 13 years, 13 summers um, processing and then, and then catching salmon um, as part of an incredible migration that takes place, human migration and uh, fishery migration that takes place every summer in Bristol Bay. Um, and uh, communities that have spent last 20 years or so fighting to prevent the massive open pit uh, pebble mine, a, a proposed gold and copper mine from being built at the headwaters of two of the world's most productive sockeye salmon streams. And um, were successful just earlier this year or last year, um, I can't quite remember now, um, in securing a very important Clean Water Act protection for that watershed. And while it doesn't completely prevent any mine from being built in the in the Bristol Bay watershed. It goes a long way to ensuring that those watersheds stay pristine and continue to provide for jobs like theirs and like mine for the future. Um, you can go to the next slide. And there are so many other heroes that I could mention if I had all day, like Chris Brown from Point Judith, Rhode Island, Linda Bankin in Sitka, Alaska, Larry Collins in San Francisco, Melanie Brown, who fishes in Naknek, Alaska, and Richard Nelson, who recently retired from fishing out of Friendship, Maine. On this slide, you'll see people who have helped launch Maine's Ocean and Coastal Acidification Network, who have co-authored the Fifth National Climate Assessment, who have rallied for water management that supports vibrant salmon runs, and much, much more. Um, so clearly, Despite the passage of 33 years since that Earth Day when I first became an environmentalist, it is still possible to be a hero, and I'm surrounded by them every day. But is it still possible to save the world? Next slide. With carbon concentrations in the atmosphere at 420 parts per million and rising, is humanity capable of moving fast enough to stave off the worst impacts of climate change and to ensure that those who are most affected by the inevitable consequences of climate change that are already baked in are treated fairly um, and, and assisted in, in their adaptation. And more to the point, what does saving the world exactly mean at this point? Um, we can't get back to the world we once had. Um, is saving the world just about parts per million of carbon dioxide? Or is it about something more than that? Are there tough choices that we have to make when we decide which parts to save and which parts we let go? That question isn't as simple as it appeared in 1990. You can go to the next slide. 
And in the fishing world, we are grappling with these challenges and these questions every day. Um, there isn't a fisherman that I know on either coast who isn't seeing the effects of climate change playing out in real time on the water, in our catches, in our bottom lines, in our communities. Um, sometimes these changes can be catastrophic as it was this winter in the Bering Sea crab fishery pictured here in which two of the main uh, crab fisheries that are prosecuted by those, by those vessels were shut down completely. They had no season. Um, so that had major economic repercussions throughout the North Pacific fleet. Um, and that industry you know, has been grounded and has been seeking help through the federal government for uh, fisheries disaster relief. Next slide. But, and it sometimes surprises the public to hear this, the impacts of climate change are not universally negative. And Maine is an example of where there have been a series of really good years as the thermal habitat preferences of the American lobster, Homaris americanus, have become actually better aligned with the current day temperatures of the Gulf of Maine as, as waters have been warmer. You can go to the next slide. And a similar story has played out in Bristol Bay, Alaska, where I fish, which has seen record-breaking season after record-breaking season in the recent years as other parts of Alaska have experienced downturns. You can go to the next slide. And in some places, the story is more complex. So in Rhode Island, where I fish, um, there's been an abundance of warmer water fish like the black sea bass pictured here, moving into our uh, into our area or, or fishery species like this that have always been here just becoming more abundant um, as their thermal habitat preferences shift northward. Um, but due to fisheries regulations that are based on the historical distribution of those fisheries and those catches, fishermen in southern New England have been largely unable to capitalize as much as they would like to on the newfound abundance of these species. Um, some of the longer term predictions for fisheries are a bit scarier no matter where you fish. That's because warming waters are generally less productive. That's the reason that you don't see the same volumes of fish caught in the tropics that are caught in places like the North Pacific or the Gulf of Maine. Um, and then there's ocean acidification, which over time, this century is likely to have some significant negatives for the production of calcium based organisms like some plankton and many of the, the shellfish species that are often the most lucrative species that our fisheries depend on. So there is no question that the fishing community coast to coast is on the front lines of climate change. And we will be bearing the brunt of this. However, in the short term, fishermen are probably more concerned, somewhat ironically, about some of the solutions that are being proposed to combat climate change. You can go to the next slide. In Southern New England, um, I would say the primary concern uh, for fishermen at this moment in time is the fast tracked development of offshore wind. Um, this is driven in, in part by state renewable energy goals and driven in part by President Biden's goal of deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, which would set the US up for a longer range uh, aspiration of 110 gigawatts by 2050. Based on the current technological capacity of a state-of-the-art wind turbine, which is about 13 megawatts, a back-of-the-envelope calculation suggests that 110 gigawatts in 2050 would be eight and a half, about 8,500 winds at sea, each one with a blade diameter longer than a football field, each one attached to a substation and then to land by cables that are as much as a foot thick. Um, the construction and the operation of these wind turbines are predicted to result in noise, increased turbidity, habitat alteration, electromagnetic fields, and extraction of wind energy with possible impacts for the magnitude of remaining wind speeds and strengths, um, currents, water stratification, and upwelling, which essentially drive the entire productivity of the marine ecosystem. So, you can understand why fishermen are concerned. Proponents of offshore wind don't deny these impacts, and I should say potential impacts because these haven't been built, so we don't, we don't know, but there's plenty of research out there that suggests these are potential impacts. 
Um, and proponents of offshore wind don't deny these impacts. They just claim that these are the price we have to pay to save the planet from the even worse impact of global climate change. For example, a West Coast uh, offshore wind executive was recently quoted as saying, we can't afford not to use any of the renewable resources that are available to us. We have to tap into anything we can because the consequences are not suitable for humans. And this is a message you hear again and again when you go to offshore wind permitting meetings um, on either coast. And it's not only offshore wind proponents that are wrapping themselves in the green energy mantle. I've been referring several times throughout this presentation to the work that the Bristol Bay fishermen, native tribes and local communities in Alaska have done to protect their coast, their estuaries and their watersheds from the proposal of uh, one of the world's largest open pit gold and copper mines at the headwaters of their, of their watershed. Um, when they were successful at getting the EPA to use Clean Water Act authority to block that mine, um, the CEO of that mine shot back with a quote calling that move a giant step backward for the Biden administration's climate change goals. Um, because of the fact, of course, that we need a large amount of copper for things like ocean wind farms, um, as well as many of the other sort of grid improvements that, that are uh, being contemplated um, as strategies to, to get off of fossil fuels. Um, I think it's fair to expect that from now on, we can anticipate that every corporation seeking to fast track any kind of mega project over community objections and environmental concerns is likely to make some kind of argument that's related to saving the planet from catastrophic climate change. That doesn't mean that climate change isn't occurring. Um, the question that we as citizens, as an environmentalist, need to ask ourselves is, are, is the crisis of climate change really so grim that we need to immediately put healthy ocean ecosystems wild fisheries and coastal communities at risk in the hopes that this new cleaner power will magically displace fossil fuels? Or is it possible to solve the climate crisis in ways that don't jeopardize these ecosystems in these communities, but instead uplift the things that we all care about, like oceans, coastal communities, and wild seafood? You can go to the next slide. And so that is the thought that drove the creation of the fishery friendly climate action campaign and this is the only um, slide i'm going to show you with text on it because it's really really important we created this new definition um which i can't, i can't really read it there's some blocks on my screen that are blocking out and i probably should know this by heart um give me a second i've got it printed out sorry about that i don't know why but i can't see the whole screen um so we define fishery friendly climate action. I hope the rest of you can see the whole screen. I hope it's just on my end, um, but sorry. The, the fishery friendly climate action campaign is a network of fishermen, uh, equal parts Alaska, West Coast and New England that defines fishery friendly decarbonization solutions as those that simultaneously reduce, sequester and avoid greenhouse gas emissions avoid collateral impacts on the physical, chemical, and ecological properties of ocean, coastal, estuarine, and watershed ecosystems, avoid interference with the harvest and provision of wild seafood, wherever possible contribute conservation co-benefits that enhance the resilience of coastal, estuarine, and watershed ecosystems, help the commercial fishing industry voluntarily address its own carbon footprint by supporting transition to low carbon fishing vessels and contributing to putting the US on track to reduce its share of greenhouse gas emissions to a level that will hold warming well below two, two degrees centigrade. So we're on the search for solutions that get us there, that can move us as far down the path as possible to net zero by 2050, which is the internationally accepted goal of where we have to get to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, but that do so in a way that also lifts up and supports other things we care about, like the seafood that, um, that your fishermen in Maine um, and people like me in Rhode Island and Alaska and everywhere else around, around uh, 
go out and catch and depend on and a tradition that we are so proud to carry on and want to continue carrying on into the future. Um, you can you can actually just close the uh, the PowerPoint at this point. That's my la that's my last slide. So we don't have the answers yet to how you do this. We are actively pursuing partnerships, pursuing funding, pursuing experts who can advise us on how to uh, how to sift fishery friendly from fishery risky solutions and then build an action plan that will get our states, our regions, our communities, our nation to the goal of, of um, net zero by 2050 in a way that helps rather than hurts um, fishery ecosystems and communities. Um, but I don't unfortunately have a roadmap for that yet. We're just at the beginning of stages of it. And of course, we don't have much time, not only because um, you know, the IPCC has said that we basically have until 2030 to get ourselves on track to net zero by 2050, but also because um, right now we're going down a road um, at breakneck speed that has significant, uh, poses significant risks for fishery ecosystems and fishing communities. Um, so time is really critical. It is a code red. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions um, or invite any, any thoughts that all of you have. Um, on this, this tricky subject and how we can all sort of connect at the core of what matters to all of us as people who care about the environment, about the climate, about our coasts, about our fisheries and see what we can do together. Thank you, Thanks. Sarah. And my apologies, I'm not sure, I'm not seeing the black boxes other people are reporting seeing on their screens. I did turn off the caption feature. I don't know if that's helped anybody, um, but I, I apologize for the technical issue. I'm not sure what's causing it. Hopefully everyone can still hear us okay and they won't be visible on the recorded version. So I'll kick off with the questions. Um, thank you, Sarah. As someone, uh, as a seafood eater myself, what would you recommend um, in terms of things that I could start doing tomorrow here in Maine or wider, you know, in New England uh, that would be more mindful in my consumption? Well, um, the easy, the answer is sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's easy and hard at the same time. So sure. um, it's a, it's a straightforward answer, which is you should, you should be eating um, whatever's in your local waters in proportion to their abundance and to be adaptive as that abundance changes. Um, how do you know what's abundant in your local waters at any given time and how that's changing is a tougher question. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the best ways is just if you are living on the coast is to get to know your local fishermen um, and, and, and ask them, you know, what, what's abundant these days? What do you want me to eat more of? What do you need a little boost? You know, what are you trying to, <laughs> what are you trying to find a market for that I can help um, and cook up something new and tell my friends, you know, being, being flexible, um, being, uh, being curious, um, being willing to go out on a limb with a species you haven't tried before is always important. Um, but then again, there's some super abundant species. Like right now, honestly, as a Bristol Bay fisherman, we have a massive market glut because we've had such a tremendous record-breaking season last year. I want everybody to go out and eat as much Bristol Bay sockeye salmon as you can so that the processors have a place to put it in a month and a half when we start fishing again. All right, good to know. <laughs> Uh, we got a question from the audience. Is it more environmentally con is more environmentally conscious fish farming happening to allow wild fisheries to become more wholesome? I am probably not qualified to speak on that. Um, I, I don't feel that I'm really deep into the issues on the no. pros and cons of farmed farm seafood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. Um, there are plenty of other resources you can look for online. Sure, I apologize sure. for not. Yeah. Can you speak to someone else is asking why was the fishery in the Bering Sea closed? Who closed it? Yeah, it was closed. It was closed. Um, I'm not an expert, so I'm just going to tell you. It's okay. I'm yeah, <laughs> but um, but I, I'm not a participant in that fishery. So, um, but I, I think it was closed by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. So every region, at the, the federal fisheries are managed by regional fisheries management councils um, who, who make uh, 
they they make decisions that go up the chain to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and NOAA ha does have ultimately um, the say over. Well, Heather is, I'm sorry, we have a participant who's saying that cloud was closed by the state, so I could be totally wrong. Let, it, it was closed by the government. Um, we'll just say that. Um, keep it broad. Yeah, keep it broad. It was closed by the government, but I think, and I think there were a couple reasons. It was a very surprise closure, and I think that there, there's definitely a climate signal present in the mix, sort of retroactively when they're when they're looking at, um, you know, the time series of of a of a stock. Um, I think they were not expecting this, but now when they look at it hindcasting like they they sort of realized there was a climate signal that was present um i think there was also a lack of uh, adequate survey uh coverage during covid and so part of why it's sort of you know species go up and down that's one thing that's important to 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 recognize that the public may not be aware of is that there's a huge amount of natural variability in marine species which is why sometimes fishermen can be reluctant to to attribute everything to attribute everything to climate change because sure. a lot of that stuff is just normal um and it is the job of fishery scientists uh to to stay on top of that and i think that during COVID, and we've seen this on both coasts like there was insufficient survey coverage which has led to some surprises um all right i know you said you're not an expert on on the fish farming um so it's okay if you don't know the answer but someone else has an aquaculture question do you think that's a good alternative to conventional um fishing and lobstering this is coming from someone who says they could eat seafood three times a day <laughs> i mean a lot of a lot of fishermen have diversified into small-scale aquaculture I'm, I'm referring to like shellfish oyster mm -hmm. kelp, kelp aquaculture um so i think that that those things are are already taking place on our coast, and those are great things to support. Um, fin fish aquaculture, sort of more industrial scale fin fish aquaculture is, is a lot more controversial. Um, so I, that's that that's an area where I don't feel qualified to comment, but um, sure. I, I have participated in oyster fisheries in Rhode Island, and it is a very, it's very complementary to wild fishing. So I'm just curious, you fished in, in Rhode Island and in Alaska, um, do you ever get up to to Maine to do any fishing? Not yet. Not yet. I would love to. <laughs> um, and someone else is asking, do you have a, a sea shanty that you can share with us? I'm not going to ask you to perform on demand. I don't. And I wish other people, I wish we were in a format where other people could uh, could <laughs> could grace us with their she sea shanties. Sea shanties. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so where can people go? And thank you again. This was such a great um presentation i really appreciate you sharing all this information and it's inspiring to hear about um a lot of the other folks that you've worked alongside um and again just interesting too to see how many of them were women uh someone else is asking do you know how much how much land area of maine and its islands do can we expect to be underwater by 20 by 2050, if it's if the issue's not addressed, do you see like it? Maybe I'll, I'll generalize this a bit more. Um, do you see Maine really being impacted by by seawater rise if we don't if climate change isn't addressed? I mean, I think we all yeah. we all know that that's happening, right? Mm -hmm. like, I'm and I would think too, that, but... um, we're putting together, this is a, a bit down the road this fall, but Maine Historical Society is working with um, Greater Portland Landmarks and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute to do a panel on this topic, um, specifically how it relates to historic structures. Um, so if you are curious about sea level rise in Maine and how that could potentially infect um, the land, the built environment, historic environments, um, keep your eye on Maine Historical Society and our program listings, because we'll have something on that coming up in the fall. Um, where can folks go, uh, Sarah, to learn more um, about your organizations or just, just in general, if they want more answers on, on some of these ideas? Yeah, I'm going to put two things in the chat. This is a fisheryfriendlyclimateaction.org. That's a Perfect. simple one. That's where you can find out more about the the, the, the fishery network. Um, and then I'm also going to post, this is a bit of a a, a long read. Um, That's okay. But 
a this is like the go-to resource and it just came out about a month ago called um fisheries and offshore wind interaction synthesis of the science so if you're interested in really getting down into the weeds on what all of the potential interactions between offshore wind construction and um an operation and and fisheries both the ecosystems the fishing activities and businesses and the coastal communities and, and social and, and cultural heritage um, and economics of all that, that is the place to go. Um, it was published by the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, which is actually another, um, I'm going to dig up there. This is a fishing industry led group that uh, is nationwide, um, Road of Fisheries, um, that, that is uh, super expert and is, is leading us all to be more coordinated on. Oh, and, and Heather, thank you for putting protectusfishwin.org as well. So these are some of the grassroots organizations that are within the fishing industry that are trying to call attention to, um, to our concerns about that particular um, climate solution. Um, and then with fishery friendly climate action, we're trying to look at other climate solutions that we can really be vociferously in support of to get the job done and getting to net zero by 2050. Um, like that rooftop solar video you saw at the beginning, we're mm -hmm. also looking a lot at our own carbon footprint and trying to be proactive and creative about, um, it's not an easy question at all to think about. You can't just like, it's not like a Tesla. It's not that simple right, trying, trying right. to fishing vessels. Like Maine has 2,500 lobster boats a lot of them are on moorings you can't plug in um so we're trying to it's it's not going to be solved in the next decade or two um but we're trying to get game there um by partnering across state lines and trying to trying to tap into some federal resources to help us innovate and experiment and pilot um while also you know encouraging broader adoption of existing low-hanging fruit technologies that can make our vessels more efficient in the short term while also saving us money. Um, so that's another thing we're working on right now. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just keep, I could no, talk on that, but um, those are some resources that I would encourage you to look into. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. So check out those websites that uh, Sarah shared. And don't forget too, um, if you haven't seen Code Red yet in person uh, to come by Maine Historical Society, our exhibit galleries are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 5. You can learn more about the exhibit and actually buy your tickets online if you visit mainhistory.org. Uh, and you can also see a digital version of the exhibit on Main Memory Network, which is uh, mainmemory.net. We've got some other great uh, programs in this series coming up. Uh, later this month on May 25th, we'll have a talk with Christoph Ermscher, um, who's going to talk to us about uh, Louis Agassi um, and his contemporaries. Uh, Louis Agassi, Agassi, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but um, kind of a an important but very controversial figure uh, in the study of, uh, of biology. Um, in June, oh, and also too, we've got... Um, Earl Shuttleworth is going to be with us next week, uh, twice to do for his two-part series on um, 150 years of Portland homes. The in-person tickets are all um, are are all spoken for, but you can join us on Zoom just like you are tonight. Um, so go to mainhistory.org um, to register. And we've got lots of fun stuff coming up in June, a talk on summer cottages on Little Shabig Island on June 6th. That'll be in person. A uh, talk on Elizabeth Oaks Smith um, and her uh, climb of Mount Katahdin. That talk will be in person on June 13th. And a book talk on um, Easy Money, American Puritans and the Invention of Modern Currency. Uh, that'll be virtual on uh, June 15th. So lots of great stuff coming up. And don't forget, if you're a member too, we've got member tours of the exhibit. Our curator, Tilly Lasky, uh, her next um, tour for members is on June 7th uh, at 1230. So if you haven't become a member yet, not only do you get into the exhibits for free, um, but you can get a great tour uh, with the curator. So thank you guys um, so much for being here this evening. Thank you, Sarah. This was uh, really interesting and inspiring. Uh, when you do finally make it up to Maine to do some fishing, let us know, and we'd love to see you uh, at Maine Historical. Thank you, Kathleen. This was wonderful and, and so nice to share an evening with all of you. Thank you. It was our pleasure.